At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce my coworker um, and your moderator, Dr. Iveta Giergova. Iveta is the director of the Department of Folk Life and Cultural Studies at Wheaton Arts. And she will moderate your questions again in that you place in the Q&A window. At the end of the presentation, she will share your questions and um, we really encourage you to ask those questions. That helps us make this an interactive evening. So welcome everyone and over to you, Aveta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. Hello everyone. I have to admit I'm really excited this evening because this talk is so important. We consider these uh, presentations as a kind of introduction to uh, the exhibit that we will be opening next weekend. So after this uh, conversation today, you will be looking at the exhibit with different eyes because you will know much more about the Mayan textiles that you know at this moment. So I'm very, very happy to introduce our guests. They represent two major partners of, um, of the Folk Life Center in this endeavor the Ixchel Museum for Indigenous Dress and the Friends of the Ixchel Museum, which is an organization based in the US um, and in Philadelphia, which is very close by. So our first, um, uh, my first um, introduction would be for Barbara, Barbara Nokia de Arathon. She's a Guatemalan scholar she has a master's degree in cultural anthropology from Wayne State University in Michigan. She's an associate researcher at uh, Universidad de Valle de Guatemala and the Excel Museum of Indigenous Dress, where she, uh, she was a, a director of exhibitions for 17 years. And she continues to work with the Excel Museum as a consultant till this day. Barbara is an international speaker. She has written several books and articles on the uh, indigenous textile tradition and is a, a co-author of Berg Encyclopedia of World Dress and Fashion. She is a permanent member of the Ac Academy of Geography and History of Guatemala since 2000. And uh, she, she held different offices in its board of directors, including being a president from 2013 to 2015. I'm really, really honored to have Barbara as our guest today. And our other guest would be Anna Maria Zouk. Anna Maria has uh, an MBA dual degree in marketing and international business from Columbia University, also an MA in Latin American studies, concent uh, concentration anthropology from Stanford. Her career was mainly in marketing with an emphasis on strategy. She worked at Merck International Pharmaceutical Marketing, McKinsey Management Consulting in both Australia and in the United States. States and IMS Global Pharmaceutical Marketing Services. She retired as Chief Marketing Officer with global responsibility for branding, company positioning, including advertising and international website development, and competitive intelligence. Her first job was at the Stanford University Library. Anna Maria's mother was a first-generation American from Guatemala. Every third summer as a child, she visited the country, then annually as a teenager, now retired, she devotes considerable time to museum activities. She is also keen to advance the United States knowledge of Guatemalan and specifically Mayan weaving excellence and tradition. Welcome to you, uh, Ana Maria. Uh, and uh, now I would like to invite you to begin the talk. Thank you, Iveta. I'm delighted to be here this evening and provide you all with a context introduction to our conversation on Mayan textiles. And by those, I mean specifically those from Guatemala. So let's dive right in. This is a Guatemalan weaver. How would you know that? 
Well, there are clues. Uh, she's weaving on a backstrap loom. You can see it's around her waist and the loom is created by the tension of her body. This is very typical in Guatemala. She's also wearing indigenous clothing from head to toe. She's wearing clothing from a specific village. If you knew what you were looking at, you would know that she's from Concepcion, Chiquirichapa. But where is she? She's actually weaving at a metro stop in Washington, DC. <laughs> She's Angelica Lopez, part of a weaving cooperative sponsored by the Friends of the Ixchel Museum. My task today is simple. I want to talk a bit about the Museo Ixchel. I want to talk a bit about the Friends of the Ixchel and a little bit about me. So let's start with the museum itself. The museum is in Guatemala City today but it started life in 1973, very small and in the suburbs of Guatemala. But by 1993, the doors opened to this stunning building. It was designed by Guatemalan architects. It was funded by donations from both international and national audiences. And it's on a university campus. The frieze that you see on the brick there is a textile symbol of the Rupan Plato the offerings plate. The museum boasts a conservation lab, which is really leading edge. Their collection numbers several thousand and it's about 60% cataloged and digitized. They solicit ongoing grants for this process and we the friends are funding the photography. Why collect these textiles? Because they are disappearing. Each village used to have its own distinct style colors and designs, but they change over time and they fall out of use entirely. Overtaken by commercial textiles, their distinctiveness is being lost. And that's why examples need to be collected and preserved. Fortunately, the staff is capable and dedicated with a wonderful curator, Violeta Gutierrez. She offers special backstage tours, which have been a real hit. Here you see a group of visitors enjoying the increasingly rare textiles, and they're amazed by the sophistication of the process. The Museo Ixchel has unparalleled expertise. It's so special that they were named a Google Arts and Culture Partner. And although the museum's website has its own virtual tour, Google funded it and created one of its own sites. So go online and see it. It's not like being there, but you get the flavor. The building is large and spacious. Typical museum galleries take you through the history, the types of weaving instruments, techniques, and a variety of both pieces and full trajes. Yes, it's a textile museum, but they also have some interesting ancillary collections. One is the original set of watercolors by Carmen Pedersen. These are fabulous depictions of indigenous villages, trajes, and it's village by village by village. This is Santiago Titlan. So note the predominance of red and white and distinctive halo head ribbons. The men hardly dress like this anymore and the women's style has changed dramatically. These watercolors are published in a book and the text is outdated but the watercolors remain really important for research and are key reference points. So are photographs. The museo has historic photographs that are invaluable and they're used to supplement the displays and support research as appropriate. Check out these Cofradia outfits and Barbara will share a few more photos with you shortly. In addition to the permanent galleries, the museum puts on temporary exhibits and they are spectacular. They change every two years. They're supplemented with acquisitions for the exhibit. They're always professionally designed and they're based on team field work combined with historical research. They usually have a publication. This exhibit was on Cofradías, which are religious organizations responsible for the material care of images, pilgrimages, and ceremonies. By the time the museum is finished, it's a real stage set. 
Look at the paper cut out ceilings and the huge photo of an altar and the float. This enables the room to create atmosphere. So when they feature textiles, they're in context. Often they show complete head to toe trajes, as you can see on the right. But even when individual pieces are shown, they gain meaning. Individual huipiles can stand alone, but they benefit from the references to the processions. Look at the monkey figure in the center begging for donations and the parade giant over on the right. Fantastic. I mentioned that weaving is an art form with disappearing. The museo also offers workshops, many of them on weaving so that the skills are preserved. One example is this outreach in the village of Santiago Atitlan. The girls are struggling with even a small and relatively simple loom. By the way, if you remember the watercolor and the original dominance of red, the girl on the lower right is from Santiago, but she has chosen green. Other workshops do charge fees, creating a source of income to supplement the visitor. Here's another example. This is the annual gala, not held this year, but in past years. This one was linked to a special exhibit on chachales, which are the typical necklaces of coral and silver that are still used for special occasions. Many museum members actually loaned their own private chachales for that show. And finally, the museum generates and sells academic publications. The ones on the right are linked to the exhibit I just showed you and are the most recent in print. The Friends usually funds the translation into English or the creation of a bilingual publication. On the left is the first example of a publication done just by Friends, a small, well-illustrated booklet that accompanied our San Jose exhibit. And you'll be able to buy this at Wheaton. So who are the Friends of the Ishel? The Friends is a charitable organization with a dual mission. We support the museum in Guatemala and we educate people in the US. We provide grants for the museum and sponsor projects, as well as receiving donations from US members that make this possible. Both entities are dedicated to preserving the textile tradition. And we are basically all volunteers with a connection to Guatemala. We've been active since 1984. Uh, we were funded by an initial private donation. We're all volunteers. Most of us have links to Guatemala. Some were born there, some are Guatemalan, some worked there, some studied there, and three of us had Guatemalan mothers, and I'm one of those. So yes, I have academic credentials, uh, the BA and the master's were both in Latin American studies, but I'm not a textile maven. Still, my home was always decorated with textiles and we visited Guatemala often. I joined the Friends in 1989 when I moved back to the US. My family has always appreciated the beauty and complexity of indigenous dress. Here, for example, is an old photo with my mother on the left in a ceremonial we peel from, do you remember? Santiago Atitlan. So you see the red skirt, the chachal necklace, the halo head ribbon. The middle is an outlier. That's my tia Lili in a dress typical of Panama. You can ignore that. And on the right is my tia Cristina in a traffic from a village just up the road from Antigua where they live. Tia Lili was actually the most interested in textiles and she started a small centro cultural on the farm in Antigua, which she shows just trajes from Zacatepeques, which is our own departamento. So it's important to honor my mother's heritage, hence my role with the Friends of the Ishel. So back to the Friends, a noted te textile collector is our curator. He is Raymond Senek. He's published a number of books. He lectures frequently. He has an amazing personal collection and he has identified, photographed and guided our collection, including making many personal donations. 
Our own collection numbers well over 800 pieces. They are located in Pennsylvania, so we can do exhibits without the transport and customs hassles. All of our pieces have been donated. Some are from noteworthy collectors, others are souvenirs from former diplomats or Peace Corps volunteers. Most of them are wipilis, which is the typical blouse shown here. And we also have a variety of skirts, belts, head coverings, carry cloths, etc. These skirts are woven by men on a large footloom, and they're also distinctive to a village, but not as rigidly as the wipilis. Speaking of men, we don't have many men's caps. They are the hardest to collect. Unfortunately, men stop using traje way ahead of the women. They go to work outside the village, and frankly, they find jeans and t-shirts much easier to wear. The pants on the right are actually underpants and very rare. These will be featured at the Wheaton exhibit, and Barbara will show you an illustration shortly. Our friend's collection is diverse. Here is a real treasure. This is from Santa Lucia Uxtatlan, and it's the lead item from our San Jose exhibit. The embroidered lacy sleeves and collar are remarkable and they're very hard to find. We have huipilas, which are antique and rare, but we also try to stay on trend. Here are two examples of modern traje. Not too long ago, the monochrome trend swept the country. And these are not village specific and they're mostly machine made. All the components can be purchased in the local market. The belts are beaded. You might not be able to see that too well. And they're usually the most expensive part of the outfit. Our collection is so extensive, we can do comparisons over time for the same village. In this case, Todos Santos. The older one is on the left and you can see they're related with elements such as the neck design and the red stripes repeated, but they're not the same. They're sort of cousins. And here's another example, just to give you the flavor. This is from Santo Domingo and the colors on the older piece on the left are more subdued. The animals are smaller. And on the right, the whole impression is brighter and bolder, and the figures are much bigger. It reminds me of when the uh, Ralph Lauren polo player went from teeny to huge. <laughs> and you'll see this kind of comparison at Wheaton, and Barbara will show you the same village in more modern times later on. But how about some real change? You remember the girl from Santiago dressed in green on the left? Well, on the right is something I just snipped from Facebook from one of the videos from a local store in Santiago selling new trajes. And the other we feel they offered were in a variety of colors and neither resembles the original red with stripes. So the friends have a collection. What else do we do? We used to do a free newsletter twice a year. We maintain a website. We do exhibits large and small and often info tables or demonstrations of weaving at various related events. We do a lot. So let's put a little color on this list. Here's an example from a street fair in Philadelphia. We sponsor a weaving cooperative and are doing demonstrations anywhere. Having a live weaver is always a huge attraction. This co-op was set up by our director Yolanda Alcorta whom you may have heard in a prior Wheaton conversation on sawdust rugs. We also do exhibits, major and minor. On the small end, we've started doing school exhibits, thanks to our directors, Shannon and Chase Davis. They're simpler, they're easier to install, and they're a lot of fun. And we are just now putting one up at Haverford. Some of these feature a donated set of special dolls. They're not only adorable, but they're actually correct depictions of the specific villages. On the bigger stage, our recent large exhibit is traveling to New Jersey. Here are a couple of shots from our former show in California. On the left, we did a maker's ball to show 
the complexities of both embroidery and weaving. And on the right, some complete trajes from Chichi Castenango. And I know these trajes will be on display at Wheaton as well. As a reminder, the Wheaton Show opens on September 24th. We look forward to seeing you there, but if you can't make it, the coordinates for the museum and the friends will be put in the chat room. So let's go back to the beginning. Now you know what's going on. In this case, it's Jenny Suarez and her mother Florinda from Concepcion Chiquirichapa doing a live weaving demonstration on a backstrap loom at a street fair in the US. See, you can do it. Thank you for your time. And we'll be on to Barbara shortly for some deeper textile learning. Iveta, were there any questions posed during this intro? Just one uh, for you, Anna Maria. Uh, people were asking whether the collection of the Shell Museum is online. Can they see some of the pieces if they visit their website? Yes, um, that was uh, a long-term project. The museum has put a portion of its collection online. So if you go to the museoishell.org, um, there are a couple of choices you can make, and one of them does show highlights of the collection. They don't have the whole collection online, but they've been selective and they've put some highlights. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice if you uh, if you put in the chat uh, their website. And um, is there any translation in English or is it, is it all uh, in Spanish and in uh, Mayan languages? It's not in Mayan languages, but we have sponsored a version of it in English. So when you go on the website, you have a choice of continuing either in Spanish or in English. Uh -huh. And how about your collection? Is it uh, online? Can people no. see it? <laughs> no, oh. Again, if you go to our website, you'll see our bulletins and our bulletins feature pieces from our collection, but the entire collection is, is not there. All right, maybe we can uh, promise our guest tonight that uh, this is a project uh, for the future. We'll try to get some highlights up. Well, some highlights of um, your collection, people will be able to see at Whitnards um, after next Saturday. Uh, and um, they will, will be displayed in a different way. Um, we are not displaying the, um, the wheels open, uh, but on body forms. So we'll be closer to how they look on people, which uh, is a way of interpreting. And um, I hope uh, that this um, comparison between the old and the new and how traditions evolve over time and how they change over time would be something that we can uh, discuss with our visitors uh, and they encounter with your collection. And um, also um, there's uh, one more question that just popped up. Uh, you mentioned Haverford. Uh, when is this exhibit? It's next week. <laughs> I think it's uh, opening its doors on the 22nd, and they're just in the process of mounting it now. And it's really going to be amazing because not only uh, will they have a, a live weaver and food and the rest, but it's geared for school-age children. And there are going to be special guided tours every half hour um, and I think they're shortening them to every 15 minutes because the demand has been so high. So I'm sorry, I've got a quick correction. It's at the school, but not the college, right? Haverford. Yes, yes. Elementary. Yes, so, so, someone uh, actually answered this question uh, in, in the chat. Okay. So people will have to be combining exhibit openings next week. Uh, and that is good. So we'll be seeing a, a lot more of uh, Mayan textiles in the near future. Uh, and now I would suggest that we continue with um, uh, the presentation by Barbara. I'm so honored, Barbara, that you are with us tonight. Let's uh, continue, and if people have more questions for Anna Maria, they can still put them in the in the, the Q and A, and 
Anna Maria will answer after that when you will have your own questions as well. All right. Okay. 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 Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. It's a lovely afternoon here in Guatemala City. I am a Guatemalan anthropologist, as you have heard, living in Guatemala City. And for many years, I have had the privilege of being part of the team of researchers who have visited several villages over many, many years. So what you will see here is an invitation for you to appreciate what you're going to see in this exhibit, because it always makes you think what you find there, there's a possibility that something is changing. So I'm just going to give you a glimpse to weaving life via fiber arts. So thank you for mu so much for being with us. Okay, Guatemala. Guatemala is a very small country located in the middle of Central America, in the north part of Central America. As Mimi mentioned, we have 22 departamentos. In those 22 departamentos, we have a huge Maya population, about 6 million people who still speak their uh, Mayan languages. And they're located in all these uh, colored areas that you see here, mostly covering the highlands of Guatemala. Of those 22 departments, they're around um, 325 municipalities. And actually, uh, the Excel Museum has textiles collected from 147 municipalities and 34 hamlets. So it adds up to 181 communities somehow represented in the Excel Museum collection. Okay, now we go to the past. The roots of the Maya textile tradition in order to understand them, we have to go to the classic times in which the Maya developed a very sophisticated textile tradition. So here we see samples of the uh, uh, very prominent women who were dressed with their ceremonial uh, attire in order to perform rituals. In the left, you see uh, Lady Shock, who is inserting a rope in her tongue in order to participate in a bloodletting ritual. And we see her dress with a very complex headdress and especially her long uh, garment, which makes us think of the uh, actual ceremonial with Piles in Guatemala. We see in the middle, uh, Bert Jawar's wife, also from Yaxilan in Mexico, and she is dressed with a, a, a beautiful garment, and she's holding a basket in which she holds bark, pa bark paper that she will have burned later in order to be connected with her ancestors. Now we see in the right a woman of the elite, we always have to remember that only members of the elite were represented in these uh, 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 elements of high art in uh, Maya culture in pre-Hispanic times. So she wears a wrap around skirt that as you have seen is very important a garment in Maya dress or traje today. Now, we have to remember that or, or think that in the 14th to 15th century in the area of Yucatan, the Maya people made bark uh, books, which they painted uh, relating to ritual locations, to their uh, agricultural calendars. And we see some men, mainly men and women represented in, in those uh, uh, books. For instance, we see in the left, a male character who is dressed with a loincloth, loincloth, a headdress. And in the middle, we see a deity which is dressed with a special cape, most likely painted. It is uh, believed that in pre-Hispanic times, the uh, weavings were painted on top of the uh, uh, weavings. Now we see in the right, a warrior who was dressed with a shikoli or a special type of vest in order to take place 
in war. War was very important for the Maya people since classic times, 600, 900 AD to before the Spaniards arrived in Guatemala. Now, we have to make a big jump in time. There was a big history, uh, a historical change brought in Guatemala thanks to the conquest and colonization of the Spaniards. In the 16th century, one of the big changes that was made uh, is the introduction of the foot loom or the treadle loom in which wider and longer weavings can be woven. And the Spaniards also introduced and the indigenous people very fast learn how to uh, adapt all these techniques and procedures uh, into making their uh, weaving, especially the men. The men dramatically change their clothing, but they also learn how to spin by hand, how to warp the threads in order to, to weave. Now, as you see, it, you see that uh, wool was brought by the Spanners you see how in the middle, a special um, type of uh, wraparound skirt woolen worn by the men in several villages was also uh, learned to be woven in colonial times. And we also see that in the skirts that were woven by women, by men, but worn by women, the Spaniards also introduced techniques like embroidery. They also introduce other techniques. Now, we go to the, to the early 18th century and we think of this man who is, we can see that he is collecting cochineal, the insect from which a very beautiful dye can be obtained in order to uh, uh, apply it into the thread and produce thread like the one that you see in his overpants that uh, were, uh, they were dyed with the cochineal dye, which was a very important uh, dye in Guatemala, also indigo, and it was exported to Europe. We see a type of cotton, or long sh or overshirt, which he is wearing, which is part of what men, uh, Maya men wear today. We also see a woman from 18th century from Hacatenango in Huehuetenango, and she's wearing a long white weepin. We have to remember that in these times, it was most likely that many, many weepiles were white, and as time evolved, they started decorating them because they didn't have access to many color threads, to many yarns as they are uh, today. We look at her wraparound skirt, most likely dyed with indigo, the blue skirt. Now, we have to look at this a couple from San Pedro Las Huertas in Zacatepeques, in the department uh, of Zacatepeques, and they were dressed with special attire. A, the woman wears a white whipil, a wraparound skirt called morga, which is characteristic of several villages in that area. And she's carrying a baby who is, who is wearing a special hat which was uh, woven in order to protect babies from evil eye. And, and her husband is wearing a long tunic or capichai made of wool, over pants woven with wool, and long uh, cloths or suits on top of, her, of his capichai. Now, we have to think of this uh, couple from Ciudad Vieja, also located in the department of Zacatepeques. And you see that she's wearing a pleated skirt and she's also wearing a white blouse. That pleated skirt is also one of the um, changes brought by the Spanish. You see a milk ma a woman who is wearing the same type of dress in Spain. You see how these changes came to Guatemala very fast in time. Men, as you can see here, uh, the man is dressed with a long Spanish style uh, uh, cape, which is distinctive of cofradías. Now, we have to remember or think that cofradías are very important institutions in Maya culture. What are cofradías? They are religious brotherhoods, as Mimi mentioned. They're dedicated to the veneration of a saint. 
and they were brought at the beginning of the 16th century to spread Catholic faith. And they are brought the features from Catholic religion, but also from Maya religion. And to the present, the members of the religious brotherhoods wear garments which are distinctive of their position, their office, and their rank. But we have to think that cofradías are hierarchical institutions and they have adapted to changes. So what I'm telling you now doesn't mean that it's going, that you're going to find those uh, adaptations as you see here presented in these slides. What happens, it is important to read sources like the books presented to you before by Mimi, because you can get an idea of the very fast changes that have taken place in order for cofradías to begin to lose some of uh, their impact in Maya life. Now, here we see a steward from a religious brotherhood from San Cristóbal Totonicapán, but we see him represented in a painting from church. Nowadays, what you see, if you go to the field, is going to be different from the type of uh, garments that you see him wearing, like his uh, scarf, his shirt, and the Spanish style uh, cape. But you see him wearing his insignia, which is a symbol of his position in the cofradía. Now, this is a beautiful photograph, historic photograph again from Santa Maria de Jesus, which is located near Antigua, Guatemala. And we see how at that time, men and women were using distinctive clothing. We see men wearing their capichais, their special hats with very uh, decorative uh, elements. And also we see them wearing short pants after those, uh, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, there were changes in the village in which men were almost forced or uh, coerced in order to start wearing long uh, pants as part of the uh, policies in, uh, uh, of, of, of the government. We see women also wearing their distinctive huipiles their wraparound skirts and a special type of cape or suit that you are going to appreciate the colors as we go on in the presentation. Okay, Mimi was telling you about cofradías and you want to focus, for instance, in the middle of the photo here, we see members of a religious cofradía from Patsun. How do we know that they are from Patsun because of the type of veil that they wear on their head, the type of wraparound skirt that they are wearing. But let's take a look and we go to San Juan Zacatepeques. What do we see here? We see a member from the Cofradia who is wearing the same coton or type of jacket, style of jacket that Mimi show you as part of the collection of friends and is part also of the collection of the Excel Museum. And you see women from San Juan Zacatepeques wearing uh, styles of huipiles, which are represented again in the collection of the Excel Museum, but it doesn't mean that you're going to find this type of huipiles nowadays for, for all occasions, especially among young women. And we also go here to other villages, we see, we go to Nahuala, represented here. So this is a very important collage of negatives, which was taken by Alberto Valdavellano at the end of the 19th centuries when he would go and visit each village and then he would set together all those negatives in order for you to understand that the Maya living textile tradition, it's a, a, a transformation that has evolved through the centuries thanks to the influence of Maya culture and European culture. Now, we have the opportunity to see the goddess Ixchel represented in the codex, in the Trocortesiano codex, in one of the books that was painted, as I said, in the 13th, 14th, 15th century. How is she represented? She's represented 
weaving. And she uh, is uh, known as Lady Rainbow or Red Lady at the, as the patron of weaving and fertility and also associated to the moon. Now we see that weaving is a cultural continuity. We see that this girl from San Pedro Zacatepecas still weaving in a very similar way to the goddess Sixel was doing. In fact, uh, the name from the Ixchel Museum is taken in honor of goddess Ixchel. Now, backstrap looping, lo weaving, as I said, is very important in Maya culture in several villages. What I say for one village may not apply in another village, but then let's take the case of San Antonio Huascalientes in which we see this woman weaving a panel uh, uh, for a wipil. These uh, weavers use a very complex technique in which additional threads are added as they are weaving in order to create designs that supplementary weft weaving. And that is what you see her doing. Now, this woman from Aguacatan, she is weaving in a very small loom in order to weave, also using the same technique, supplementary web brocading, in order to produce, in order to create the headdress that she is going to wear or maybe sell to other women, women in the village or other places. Now we see uh, Catalina Catinac beautifully weaving in the backstrap loom other, another panel for a wipil which is very complex and of which we're going to appreciate more in the next slides. Okay, now we go back to the how important cofradías are in Maya culture today. In Chichicastenango, we have the Chuch Cajau, which are the cofrades, who are the holders of the insignia. Insignia is the monstrance that is a symbol of their authority in their cofradia. They're wearing, again, the capishai or tunic with the traditional suit uh, tied on their head. But in other occasions, they also wear the same head cloth on, uh, tied on their head, distinctive of their position in the hierarchy. Now, women, chuchucheles, also wear special Wipiles, which you can see on top of there. Actually, you cannot see the type of wraparound skirts that you see them wearing. Actually, you could see them in one of the photographs that you're going to see with your own eyes in the exhibit that's going to be presented at Wheaton Arts. But you see them wearing special cloths. The way they tie their braids, is distinctive of Chichicastenango, and they also um, uh, have symbols like the two-headed eagle on their wipiles woven in the on the backstrap loom. Now we go to Nebach, an Ixchel-speaking village in which actually you see you find few Catholics who are preserving these traditions. There are not as many as decades ago but you still see them wearing their perraje or shawl on top of their head, their commercial cloth veil, their long wipiles, all with designs brocaded in supplementary uh, weaving and their wraparound skirts, which are also characteristic of this village. Now we go to San Martin Gilotepeque and you see the members of the religious cofradía, they call Texeles in Cachiquel, one of the 22 languages, Mayan languages spoken in Guatemala. And they also wear the special over wipiles on top of their wipiles. And you can see their veils made of commercial cloth and the type of yellow uh, headdress, which is related to the festivity of their patron saint, who is San Martin de Tours. Now we go to Tecpan, Guatemala. This is a, a village with lots of commercial activity with a very vibrant highland community. And we see how women are wearing their everyday blouse. But let me 
make a point that this is only one style that you can see in this village. Actually, Tekpan has different styles of wipiles for every day that they have evolved through time. So this is only a sample of one of that, those uh, styles worn for every day. And you notice the types of symbols which are woven in the middle of her wipile. Wipiles. In general, in many villages, women tend to weave in the middle of their wipil their most important uh, design or symbol. Now you contrast that type of wipil tucked inside the skirt or wrap, the wraparound skirt with the long over wipil, which is almost a huge coat that she's wearing after that. Uh, this shell is wearing after taking part in the procession for the uh, Cofradías Saint. Now we go to San Pedro Zacatepeques, which is another village located uh, near Guatemala. And some women are still preserving, some women, not all, because all, some women prefer commercial type of blouses. Some women prefer computerized blouse, uh, wipiles or blouses, or some women will even wear wipiles which have printed designs on cloth. But she, in, the, in her case, in the left, she is wearing an everyday wipil woven supplementary weft, uh, weft designs which are characteristic of her village. Also the type of sash, which actually is first woven in Chichicastenango. And then the women from San Pedro Zacatepeques will embroider designs which you think are, uh, which actually imitate the designs which are woven in the backstrap loom. She's wearing a wrap around morga or skirt. Now, in uh, contrast to her, we see a techel or woman from a cofradia, and she's wearing a beautiful wipil uh, made with many, many special designs, as we will see in the slides to come. She's also wearing a morga, which is a wrap around skirt, which might measure eight yards, which she wraps around her body for these special occasions, her headdress. This is a very long process, which may take the woman in the cofradia many hours in order to first to dress herself with the help of someone in order to take part in the procession. But you see that she is a, a very important person in her village. Why? Because she is a beholder of costumbre. Costumbre are the rituals who are most close to the heart and tradition of Maya people. And they are, in this case, the preservers of culture when they do take part in this type of rituals. Now, Santa Polonia. Santa Polonia, actually, you can find many beautiful uh, over wipiles, ceremonial over wipiles, which have been lost, which are a thing of the past. But in this case, when we visited the village, we could see the girls who are dressed with festive uh, wipiles or blouses, which are actually embroidered by hand, imitating the brocading, which is done on the backstrap loom. And they are also wearing aprons, which is part of the attire of many women for festivities in many villages in Guatemala. Okay, now we go to Santo Domingo Xenacog, as Mimi mentioned. Please take a look at the wipil, the ceremonial over wipil, beautifully woven with supplementary weft brocading and those type of designs in which red predominated, predominated a great deal and you see lots of white are have been substituted by these beautifully brocaded over wipiles. It means that, that these wipiles have changed, but that women invest a great deal of time in order to decorate their wipiles, in order to take part in the rituals and activities of the religious cofradias or brotherhoods. Now, 
This takes us to an older photograph of an everyday weeping of this woman from Santo Domingo, Xenaco. You see how the shades of colors have changed. You see that they're very subdued, the tones, while in the, in the slides to come, you'll see a more dramatic change for everyday uh, weepiles. The left that you see that detail is part of a sash that was traditional or belt that was traditional for the Santo Domingo Xenaco women. Now, in your right, you see a, a randa. Randa is a hand embroider in the past, traditionally, uh, in order for uh, to join panels, which are part of a wraparound square skirt in order to have the, uh, uh, the type of size which is appropriate. Now, even Back in time, we see how this Wipil from Santo Domingo, Xenaco, had less decorations. It is also related to her the economic position of women. You know, in the right, we see how the woman, the woman from Santo Domingo, Xenaco, has a, adapted in, in a dramatic change of colors with lots of reds, lots of purple for her everyday uh, now, again, Santa Maria de Jesus, this village, which is located near Antigua, Guatemala, and we see that the women use an adaptation of the Spanish veil, which is called suit, but it is embroidered, it is uh, woven in the back strap loom, and it has distinctive supplementary web brocading designs. Although you see the green suit in your right, and that has the influence of the neighboring village of San Antonio Aguascalientes, which their uh, uh, weavers who specialize in another uh, sophisticated brocading technique called marcador style, of, we will, of which we will see more. Okay, children, it is important, um, it is important that children still uh, where in many cases the distinctive with pillages with distinctive with pillages of one village like the girl in the middle she's wearing a special type of pill called kotzig which represents flowers in her design and she's wearing the wrap around which is this skirt which is distinctive of santa maria de jesus while her friends are wearing pillages which are distinctive of patricia a neighboring community and also skirts from San Juan Zacatepec, another village. Now we have to remember boys, boys in general in many villages don't wear a, any distinctive clothing. In this case, we see this boy who is wearing a special shirt, which is actually characteristic of the type of shirts that are worn by members of the religious cofradía. But this is very unusual. Santiago Zacatepec. Santiago Zacatepec is another village located maybe 35 kilometers away from Guatemala City. And for taking there a patron saint, Santiago Apostol, that's the way uh, women will dress with their uh, distinctive wipil, uh, predominantly red, and their uh, wraparound skirts. Now, what happens if you go to Santiago Zacatepec in a day which is not part of the festivities. Things might change a great deal. And this is not exactly what you may find because Santiago Zacatepec has changed. Now let's compare to Santos Cuchumatan. This is a village located in the department of Guatemala, far, far away from the city. And we see an example in the far uh, left of a wipil around the 1970s from the Excel Museum collection. And we see a, a change in colors, a change in the type of the designs, a change in the designs uh, on the color of the wipiles. And we see the women, especially old women, who prefer to use hats, uh, which is distinctive, is the only part in Guatemala where women use hats as part of everyday life. Now, Aguacatan is also located in the Department of Guatemala, and we see a big change from the 
blue and the red uh, with pillage, which were born in the past, to a big change in colors. Orange became the color of fashion in Aguacatan as, fa as back as 2008, in which you can see the skirts, the uh, huipiles, predominantly uh, orange. Now, let's go to Chichicastenango. We have seen in former slides presented by Mimi uh, that you are going to see in the exhibit Chichicastenango. Chichicastenango around the 70s, 80s had predominantly red designs in supplementary web weaving, but now they have prefer other shades of colors, other type of, uh, of yarns in order to weave their huipiles. And you notice that the huipiles from a neighboring village called Chiche, they're very similar. Why? Because they are neighboring villages which have shared a long textile tradition over time. That's why they share uh, lots of similarities in terms of their huipiles. San Pablo La Laguna is a, a community located in Lake Catitlán. It's very poor, but we see how in the 1970s, the type of embroidered birds and flowers, they have evolved into something more sophisticated. People who can afford this are able to decorate more their huipiles or blondas, which are the over colors that are uh, sewn on top of the huipiles. And we see some men that are still preserving their the use of pants, which are uh, woven by the women in the backstrap loom and then embroidered by hand by the women in this village. Santa Catarina Palopo is a very interesting community. It's a, a village that has evolved through time, but has maintained its identity. In the left, we see a whipping from the 1960s in which we see predominantly red and that evolved to predominantly turquoise. Why? Because women had the, the uh, opportunity to buy acrylic yarns in, in those type of, of threads, in those type of colors. But then, they also preferred the use of metallic thread for their skirts. And nowadays they have also shifted to other two different styles, which you do not see represented in this photograph. Now we go to Chuarancho, another village near Guatemala city. And this is the Wipil in the left, which was predominant in the 1970s. And we see that some women who take part in the religious uh, procession of the cofradía, although they are not members of the cofradía, will wear these uh, uh, beautifully brocaded huipiles uh, uh, in order to take part in their festivities. Now, what we see in the left is a young woman who is not uh, a, a following the tradition from her villages as much. In Chuarrancho also, we see a mixture of styles. We see traditional styles, but we also see, as you notice in the, in the left, the womb, the mother and her daughter are using huipiles, which are actually from Santiago Atitlán. They were woven in the backstrap blue, and on top they have a, a crochet flowers, which are sewn to them. That's not distinctive of Ch Chuarranch. Now, in the, uh, in the right, you can see a woman who is wearing a type of marcador uh, whipil. Marcador are designs which are adapted in the backstrap loom, which are uh, copied from uh, cross stitch designs from designs a long time ago. It's a very complex technique, but that's what women from villages like this and other prefer because it has become very popular, although they're very, very expensive. While some girls cannot afford to buy this type of whippiness and they would go for a generic type of blouses, which are embroidered uh, by a, with a machine. Now, what happens if you go to a village like Zacualpa? You find traditional dress, 
yes, but you find only a few women who are still wearing this type of distinctive traje. Very few. This we did field research uh, with the support of friends of the Aixian Museum. And what you find more in that village located in the department of Quiche are women who are wearing the Santa Cruz eh, del Quiche style of blouses, which are very popular. They're made of commercial cloth and they're very inexpensive. And so this gives you an idea where the trend is going in terms of change. Now, what happens with Pan Maya dress? Let's think of Rigoberta Menchú Tum, the Nobel Prize winner. It is believed that she started with the idea of mixing huipiles from different villages. You see here, for example, a woman wearing a huipil from Tamau combined with a wraparound skirt, which is generic, which was woven most likely in a village like Salcaja. But you cannot know the community of origin according to her dress, like it was in the past in the 1970s or earlier. And we see in the right, Isabel Menchú, who is from Totonicapan. She lives in Quetzaltenango. She embroiders as a way of living, but she prefers to wear a whole traje from Colotenango, which is a far distant village located in Huehuetenango. Now, what happens? You go to visit villages like Santa Barbara, located in the department of Huehuetenango, very far away, very difficult to get there. And you find that in the left, you find hardly a few girls wearing their repeal. And you find uh, it's almost like a ghost town. It makes us think of migration and how it's affected these type of villages, because you find, as I said, only a few women wearing this type of generic uh, blouses. Although in other villages like San Antonio, Huascalientes, you find this type of girl who is still wearing distinctive uh, uh, wraparound skirt. While you go and visit San Juan La Lagruna, located in Lake Catilán, and you find how the shift has uh, gone from traditional distinctive clothing to more monochromatic fashion in which one color pervades the whole traje, as you see in this young woman from San Juan La Laguna. What happens in San Andres de Betamaj, which we visited a long time ago, we see how this girl and this woman, they're still wearing their traditional traje, woven uh, the whipil in the, in the in the back strap uh, loom, the wraparound skirt. But what happens if you go to stores, what you'll find is a great variety of whipilers, which are uh, uh, woven with computerized system. And this gives you an idea of the very strong changes which are happening in many, many villages like this. This is only one example that I am mentioning. Okay, Solola, in, in spite of all the changes that I have described, Solola was quite conservative until the last decade or so. You can see the members of the religious cofradia uh, wearing their, their head suits, their wraparound head suits, their special jackets woven in wool, their uh, over pants made of wool, and the women weave the pants that you see in the other uh, photograph. And you see men for everyday life wearing this type of shirts, pants, and wrap around rodilleras woven in the in the footloom. Now, what happens nowadays? You see women who are not sticking to this tradition. So I'm mentioning here. One sample of men preserving the tradition while women are evolving in Sololá in terms of the styles of huipiles they're wearing. So that makes you think of where changes are going. San Juan Atitán is another faraway village in which it is very, um, you, you find that almost all people in the village 
do wear distinctive clothing. Even servants of the municipality, in their free hours, they are found in the uh, in the town, and they are dressed all with their uh, complete traje, including a capichai that you see in this photograph, the woolen capichai, the pants, this type of traditional pants, and you see men where a uh, who are a uh, knitting by hand crochet in crochet their shoulder strap pads. And even these are um, parts of the traje which let us know that things are changing in a slow way, in a slow motion in this uh, village. Now, as I said, uh, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's a very, um, it's a great experience to walk through San Juan Atitan in many, many streets and you find lots of textile activity like these women, these girls who are still weaving with the backstrap loom, who are still warping, who go to school wearing their distinctive wipiles. And women have the opportunity to go and select the type of yarns that they're going to use in order to weave the wipil like the one that she is wearing and even in that photograph you cannot appreciate how there are uh, ways in which she tucks her wipil which are distinctive of San Juan Atitan. Now we go to Santa Cruz La Laguna. It's a very poor village again located in Lake Catitlan but somehow women have been able to create co-ops and in this case we see how creative women are because they are embroidering by hand using a plastic bag in order to embroider by hand. So we're going to start. Thank you so very much, Barbara. This was quite an extensive overview you just did. It was not just a very small glimpse. So I really hope people appreciate the new knowledge that I just received. And you have quite a few questions at this time. Um, so some of them are um, very specific and some of them more general, but I'll ask them in the order they, they came in. Um, Mary wants to know about the hat on the man from Ciudad Vieja, Cofradia. Mm -hmm. Is it of uh, Spanish origin or not? Uh, is it uh, woven of uh, palm? or okay. something else. Yeah, uh, they are mostly woven of palm and they have lots of influence from Spanish culture. Hats were brought to Guatemala by the Spanish people, but somehow uh, each village adapted uh, the way in, the, in which they are made uh, using materials like palm in some in in many many cases in other cases like the santa maria hats that you saw in one of the photographs those uh, hats were made by palm and they were painted black then so mm -hmm. you cannot appreciate that they were made but with palm all right so another question is um from patricia do you think that um, the Guatemalan civil war significantly changed people's willingness to be identified by their village community? Yes, that is a great question. Civil war in Guatemala, which lasted from the 1960s to the 1996 when the peace accords were signed, did change dramatically Maya traffic. That means that women from some villages could not wear a distinctive wipil and, uh, and they had to stop wearing the wipiles. They had to migrate to places like Chiapas. This migration to Chiapas, for instance, had a great influence in all these changes that occurred in many villages in, in which it allowed for the exchange of designs for the exchange of materials. And also it is related to identity. How 
we have not been able to discuss how identity is, has become fluid among the Maya people who are migrants and who have suffered the consequences of a very strong uh, civil war, who did um, mean a, a, a great change in their lives, in terms of uh, economics, in terms of political situation, uh, in terms of their cultural situation in general. So it's, it's the, we need to do more research on that. I see, that, that was important question, I agree. And um, there are several questions uh, that Anna, uh, Anna Brown asked in the chat. So I'll just um, read uh, several of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, the first was, what were their clothes like before and how did the priest get them to change clothing? Huh. How did the priest get them to uh, change? If, the, uh, if they did, maybe it was not the priesthood made them change clothing but well uh, actually the the concept of morality is related not of morality but uh of of being nude uh, uh is very important uh for catholic priests and the fact that uh, many maya people uh when uh, archbishop cortes y la Raz in the 18th century visited many villages, he was astonished by the poverty, by the uh, very uh, terrible conditions in which the Maya people of that time lived. And he mentioned that he was um, struck by the nudity of people. That means that in some villages, they would not be wearing wipiles when they work inside their house. Oh, in the South Coast, women were not wearing wipiles when they would go to the, uh, even McBride, who's an American anthropologist who did research uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in Guatemala, he did mention that women, when they visited, would go from the South Coast villages to the market, they would put on their wipiles, and then when they would go back to the villages, they would take them off. Uh, uh, out. So uh, this, yes, there was change in terms of nudity in some um, in some villages. There's a famous uh, photograph by Moonbridge in UK in which you can see women from the south coast with their top uh, not covered with wipiles and they were just collecting coffee. It was part of, of their life in some parts of Guatemala. Yes. Right, so they wanted them to be covered uh, at all times, and this is how they introduced this kind of change. Yes, but we also have to think of, of whether how these, uh, uh, they're called parts in Guatemala, and uh, there's no doubt that uh, fiber like wool was very adaptive to the uh, climate conditions of some areas in Guatemala. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to be, uh, flexible in the sense that Maya people have a, a great deal of adaptation to changes and they did adapt to those kind of changes and found a way eh, eh, to, to preserve their culture, but also to adapt to the changes brought by the Spaniards. Yes, but um, at the same time, I mean, they are preserving some of it and incorporating in, into new some new styles that are demanded of them and combine in a new oh, form yes, after yes, the definitely, definitely, yes. Well, she also um, asked why is the weaving style and colors and, and designs different in each community? Did the priest dictate that or not? Uh, uh, was it a uh, uh, pre-colonial time? Okay. Uh, the thing is, as I mentioned before, we don't have that much that much evidence in terms of the type of colors. Of, uh, we know that cotton was used to weave, that wool was used was also used, but we don't know. We don't have the variety of different type of yarns and threads that are found today. So this distinctiveness that you find. 
among the different villages, I believe that it's mainly uh, a phenomena that started at the end of the 19th century in many villages. In other cases, they did not have the resources to decorate their wipiles. You'll see evidence of that in the Ixchel Museum textile collection. If you go to visit the, the, the collection room, you will see that there's a trend from the, as Mimi also mentioned, from the wipiles with very little designs, very uh, uh, little color. And there was a huge expansion in terms of designs, in terms of colors as the decades passed. So we have to think uh, about this too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, she's also asking about the shape of uh, the wipil. Why, why is this shaped? Is it because it's cooler or is it because more comfortable or why? Okay, it, it's um, Mimi is wearing a wipil. I am also wearing a wipil. And you see that this is one panel. This is another panel. And what you do with a wipil is after you finish uh, weaving it in the backstrap loom, you sew together the panels. So you find that the rectangular shape of the wipil is a result of the way it is woven in the backstrap loom in general. Mm -hmm. Because there are exceptions, there are some cases like Rabinal or San Miguel Echicaj that will only have one panel for a wipil, but in general, it has that shape. Now, if you contrast that to blouses that were introduced by the Spanish, you see that's a different story. There's lots of Spanish influence in the blouses and the decorations like golas that you have the type of colors that you wore on top of the wipiles. Mm -hmm. I think if I could add the, the, the flatness is not just Guatemalan. You, I mean, for those of you who are into Japanese textiles or something like that, it's the just- The other shape is yes. Yes, it, it is a simple shape. It's easy to store. I mean, think Marie Kondo, but I mean, it, it is a very basic shape that you find everywhere. Yes, yes. And it usually drapes naturally, so you don't need to tailor it additionally. Exactly. Yes. yes. Well, Tana uh, would like to know uh, what was used to create the indigo dye and how important is the tactile quality uh, of a way appeal? How important? Huh, that's a very interesting question. I would believe like, for instance, uh, maybe Deborah Chandler could add something here, but I think uh, Maya women in general do place an important, uh, a, a, a very conscious of the textile quality of, of our wipil. That's why in the last decades, the German thread or Ilo Aleman has become very popular because it's a very, um, uh, has a very pleasant texture uh, uh, when you weave it and it has become very popular in several villages. So yes, I think it is a, a very important among uh, many Maya uh, weavers, although I have never discussed this topic with them. Yeah, maybe also, yeah, your next good work. <laughs> I think on the dye stuffs, um, we should probably not go deep. The, if you read our bulletins, uh, Ray Sinek has done a number of pieces on dye stuffs, and there's actually a video posted either on our site or the, the textile museum site that he just did two or three weeks ago, specifically <laughs> on, on dye stuffs. So great, great. Like whole... Yes, yes. And Marcy already uh, uh, placed these links into the ch chat so everyone can save the chat and, and use them afterwards. Great, uh, he's an expert on, on dyes, so yes. highly recommended, yes. Okay, thank you, Barbara. And there are just a few more questions. Um, Mary is asking you to just say a few words about the differing style of hair braiding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, different style of hair braiding. I think she means also that the hair ribbons 
you know, the one that's the snake and the one that's the yes. yes. all, all the, the uh, complexity of the headdress, Barbara. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because uh, this is not something that uh, I have uh, done research with uh, Maya women. It's just that uh, in, in each village, uh, the girls learn how to braid their, their hair by their mothers, their grandmothers. And, and for instance, when you uh, have to use the halo type of headdress, you, you have in the past, many Maya women used to have their long hairs. So the way they would is would take their hair and wrap it and wrap it, and then they would create this halo. But nowadays, Maya women in some cases are very practical and won't go through the whole process. Now, uh, for instance, if you think of a wakatan, a wakatan headdress is very difficult to place it on top of the head. And for that, you have to be trained by someone from the village. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, um, why is there um, a lack of human figures and trees and why the only flowers shown were basically current? Were they not used hundreds of years ago? Ah, you might want to go to symbols. Um, yes. And see what you maybe say. maybe you will answer this in your second part when you're talking about motifs and symbols. We can answer this at the end. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, also, um, why is the back of a wheel considered more important than the front? Oh, the back. No, no, I'm sorry, uh, uh, that, uh, that was not uh, what I tried to, to convey. It's the fact that I mentioned that in villages like San Juan Comalapa, in the middle of the huipil, uh, in many cases, they weave the most important symbol uh, of their, of their uh, huipil. In fact, in San Juan Comalapa, they call it, um, I'm going to see the name that they use for this. Okay, it's called Rua Rukush, over the heart. Over the heart, they will place, uh, weave the most important symbol, but uh, it's not the back that it is more important. No, I'm sorry about that. No. All right. And uh, I will read one more question and then we'll stop and continue after that uh, with the next questions. Uh, how important is crochet now in Guatemala? Okay, in some villages like Awakatan, uh, women are using crochet in order to, I mean, sacapulas, I'm sorry, sacapulas. They're using crochet to decorate their huipiles and it, ha it has become very important. And traditionally in the past, it was the men who did the crochet, but now the women are taking over and over the crochet. And in, um, in villages like Coban, they would like to finish their, the colors of their wipiles with crochet and also to join, um, to join the panels of Wipiles will use uh, different uh, stitches uh, of crochet. So in some villages, it has become more popular among women, I would say in general. All right. And one very specific question, uh, how expensive is the Wipil from Santo Domingo, Xenaco? Okay. <laughs> prices, huh. Well, prices can vary a lot. Um, Santo Domingo, Xenacoj, every day we peel. I have not been able to buy it in the... Uh, lately, I have not been able to buy it, but in the past, it could range from 350 quetzales, which would be like $80, but it would range nowadays I don't know, to at least 1,000 quetzales, but for every day we peel it. This is a very tricky question. It, it's very hard to keep <laughs> track of, of how much time it is invested in weaving a we peel, how much yarn uh, it is uh, used, how much cotton. 
And I am sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. It can vary a lot and it depends on the village. In San Antonio, Huascalientes, it can go uh, from like the, the village I'm wearing my whipil from, it can go up uh, as far as 8,000 quetzales in Quetzaltenango, uh, a long ceremonial over whipil can be much more, more expensive than that, but it does vary according to the village, yes. All so. right, so it's quite a, a range, uh, uh, difficult to say. Well, I would suggest now that we um, uh, uh, go to the second part when you will tell us a bit about motifs and symbols and their meanings, and we'll take more questions uh, at the end uh, as well. Okay, so we go back to Santa Cruz La Laguna in which uh, women do uh, weave first their huipil and then they embroider by hand these triangles which represent volcanoes. And these, uh, we go now to Nahuala. Nahuala is, uh, has a strong textile tradition. They weave different styles of huipiles for everyday occasions and for ceremonial occasions. Now, it, the design is so complex that it is it's difficult to uh, see how uh, a symbol can be represented in this type of everyday repeal, um, which was worn in the 1990s to the, to, to the 2000, but it's still uh, woven nowadays. Now, if we go to the next slide, this is uh, um, a representation of the star or to me, how it is called in Quiche language, in Cachique language. And this uh, brocaded design, according to two weavers from Nahuala, in the traditional worldview of this community, it is believed that babies come from the skies where they have been stars. And also when grandparents or abuelos die, they become stars. So it is the symbol of a cycle of life for the traditional believers of the worldview in Nahuala, uh, the Nahuala village. Now, the Techelers or members of the Cofradia or Ritual Brotherhood in Sololá, they will wear a long over whipil called Nim Pot, which is a huge whipil, a big whipil, we see here only a small detail of a purple applique which is sewn on the, on the color. And this represents the sun and other cosmic elements. But according to the old ladies of the village, eh, as this was um, found out in a research done in the 1980s, but it's still part of their uh, uh, somehow it is part of their worldview. Although for young people, if you ask them, perhaps you will get a no for an answer because they are not in general interested in this type of information. San Mateo Estatán, another village located in Huehuetenango where you see less and less this type of traditional embroider uh, with pilas with lots of hand embroider and uh, which is embroidered on two layers of muslin for, because it's a very cold uh, uh, area. And this here we see represented a symbol which we will, are going to appreciate in the next slide. This is the star, uh, the sun uh, represented uh, embroidered in the whipping from San Mateo Ixtatán. The complexity of embroider is stunning, but only this design is related to, uh, to a special symbol like the sun. Now we go to San Juan Cozal, which is another Ishil speaking village in which in the everyday we build, the women traditionally embroider four parts, which you can see here, one, two, three, four parts, we represent the four directional positions, the four cardinal points of the world. Now we go to Santiago Atitlán, a community in which the worldview is very rich, it's very alive, and we uh, have 
been able to find that uh, the women who embroider uh, the, the volcanoes on the, on the color, they have said that it is believed that the triangles represent the sacred volcanoes of Lake Aditlan. And this was the traditional overwood pill which was worn by the members of the cofradia in the past. Now, this is a flowering tree called Kotzihan in Kachikel, which is uh, also done in supplementary with, uh, with web brocading. And it is considered in the past a very ancient symbol. It represents a tree which flowers and bears fruit according to a woman who was interviewed in the past. She believed that the tree of life is like a woman's life since she bears flowers and fruit and has branches which are her children. Life is never ending and that is why it is called the tree of life. The grandparents, that's how they say it. The abuelos, that's how they say it. It makes us think that it is related to the ancestors according to the anthropological information that comes from other sources. So it makes us think that this tree of life has very close ties which, which core beliefs in the traditional villages like San Pedro Zacatepec. Now in Santiago Atitlán, the tree of the world represents the axis mundi, the beginning, the end, and the center of things. The tree of life is a metaphor for plants, for women, for the cofradia itself, and for the townspeople of Santiago Atitlan, according to an anthropologist, Robert L. Carlson, an anthropo uh, American anthropologist on which we, you can read more on his uh, publications uh, and you can do research in internet. So here we see the symbol of life, the tree of life, and also in villages like Santo Domingo, Xenaco, the tree of life is woven uh, supplementary with brocading for um, cloths which are used for, uh, as part of the images which are taken in procession in the village for the festivity of the patron saint. And also we see uh, uh, another colorful representation brocaded in Santo Domingo, Xenaco in the left. And in the upper right, you can see this geometric designs, which represents flowers as well, uh, according to information given by women from Santo Domingo, Xenaco. Now in the right, we see uh, another uh, supplementary web brocading of the tree of life, which is different, very different from the one presented in the other villages. Now, this is uh, called the uh, dead turkey, Chompipe Muerto, dead turkey, or Kamnekpi, and he represents an offering which is prepared by the groom's parents for the bride's parent, parents, which is given on the day in which they get uh, married. And this is a ritual offering, which uh, you can see that this is um, a dead turkey. Why? Because the position in which his neck's, neck is placed you can see that this uh, um, turkey was, uh, uh, how do you say, killed in such a way that this it could become a ritual offering like this one. So this is a very uh, important symbol, which is woven in some uh, uh, pillars like we're going to see in the next slide here. You see in this over we peel from San Pedro Zacatepeques, in the first row you see squirrels, here you see eagles, flowering trees, or kotzihan, uh, and here you see dead turkeys represented along this uh, uh, supplementary web brocading. And again, this is part of the special over we peel which the women of, of the cofradia will wear for the festivity of their saint. 
for special occasions, although they will also wear it for their wedding, some traditional women. Now, Paling. Paling, here you see a representation of the two-headed eagle, which is woven in supplementary weft brocading. And also you see it in these uh, uh, designs uh, in this row. In the next slide, you will see more detail of the two-headed eagle, in which in some communities, it is believed that the um, that, uh, head seen in one direction or the other sees the good or the bad, or um, in some cases, it's just the fact that uh, this symbol was introduced by the Spaniards in the 16th century, but somehow it was adapted by many members of religious cofradías as distinctive of their uh, of their um, of the cofradías. And here we see uh, uh, also done in supplementary web brocading. We see deer or masat called in cachiquel, and deers were also parts of ritual offerings as presented in books like the Codex a long, uh, a long time ago. And somehow they are still uh, uh, woven in the uh, old ceremonial with pillars from San Juan Sacatepeques even to the present. And you see colors in many cases, but not in all, you see that red and purple are colors that are in many cases uh, uh, used by members of certain cofradías or religious brotherhoods. Tecpan. Tecpan Guatemala, they are uh, 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 excellent weavers also. We see how in these stripes woven with brown cotton, natural brown cotton in the past, uh, called Cuyuscate or Ixcaco or Cacojin Cachiquel, those stripes would represent furrows as they were planted in the land. And also uh, Cuyuscate or Cacoj uh, is related to the mother, to mother earth, nurturer of life. And we also see here how it is woven in the, in the Tecpan uh, Wipiles or over Wipiles, this representation of the serpent or the hills that go up and down or the, uh, of the, or the highs and lows on the life of, uh, of uh, women. And this was provided in a field research done by the Excel Museum a long time ago. Now, somebody asked about the type of headdresses. This is how they're worn uh, traditionally in Santiago Atitlán. Now, the shkap or headdress in, in the case of Santiago Atitlán is very uh, rich in terms of symbolism because somehow, as Richard Carlson has done research, it does represent the rainbow serpent of the sky, protector of the world. And uh, it was the first um, comadronas or uh, women who helped bearing children who wore this type of headband in their hair. Now we go to Nebach in which we see uh, in a perraje or show uh, a supplementary web brocading of the corn plant or a staple of the Maya people in many villages still nowadays. Rupan Plato, Mimi mentioned and she showed you a photograph of the Shen Museum and you could see the frieze. In which symbol did you see there? You saw the symbol of the Rupan Plato. The Rupan Plato, Rupan Lac, is uh, uh, a plate which is offering a dish which is offered with bread and fruit by the members of the religious cofradía to the patron saint of San Juan in the church of San Juan Comalapa so that God gives them many blessings in terms of good crops, in, ten, in terms of good trades, and many blessings in their health. So this is a very traditional symbol uh, with lots of uh, roots in, in Sapuaco Malapa. And this we see 
a representation of the Rupan Plateau supplementary located in this part. Now, what did I tell you about the, how symbols can be woven in the most important part of the Wipil? This tells us that changes are occurring because not always the traditional symbols are in the most important part of the Wipil. And in this uh, everyday Wipil, it, is, it was believed in the past that the embroidered verse would represent the Nawales or protectors or spiritual companions of the ruling class, but in the past. This was in the in many years ago. And here we see a very modern, beautiful sash, which was woven by the women from Santa, Santa Catarina, Palopo. And it just gives you an idea, again, about how diverse, how rich, how complex is the Maya textile tradition, and that we should be learning more about it. We should be doing more research about it. And it's a great opportunity for you to visit this exhibit and learn more about it and continue learning more about this important textile tradition in Mesoamerica. Thank you very much for uh, your patience, for your attention. Thank you for the Action Museum. Thank you for friends of the Action Museum and to other photographers, especially to the Maya people who have helped us in doing this research for you to learn today. Thank you so very much, Barbara. Uh, I have to admit this was phenomenal, very, very amazing presentation. And um, you said that there were 6 million P uh, Maya people in Guatemala. Well, we have about 20,000 of them in New Jersey, which is one of the reasons why <laughs> we are um, preparing this exhibit. Um, and now before I give you your last questions, I just want to use this opportunity to publicly thank you for your help with the exhibit. Uh, for helping me identify some of the symbols on the um, textiles that we will uh, display and not only identify, but translate into Kakchigil and Spanish, <laughs> which was really, really fantastic help. Um, this with the symbols uh, was um, um, amazing to learn how some of them originated from pre um, colonial times, pre-Christian times, and then adopted new meanings during the colonial period, period, and then new meanings afterwards. So nowadays they could have multiple meanings, which makes them so interesting. And each weaver can add individual meanings to already existing ones, just to enlarge the pool of meanings for each one of the symbols. Very fantastic. So. Um, I just have a couple of questions. One is, uh, why are these textiles mostly from the highlands? Uh, why not from um, south or east? Okay, the south coast of Guatemala um, uh, had the, before the Spanish came, had the influence of, um, of uh, cultures coming from Mexico. And it started to change many, many thousands of years ago. But also when the Spaniards came, they, it was not so highly populated and populated and somehow it did not attract the attention of the, of the Spanish conquerors because actually when you come to think about it, there are uh, nowadays Quiche speaking people in many uh, villages in the south coast, but there uh, nobody is doing research about them. So in generally, in general, the, the south coast, um, uh, Escuintla, Santa Rosa, um, Ajutiapa, they, they have been uh, mostly populate, uh, populated by Ladino or Mestizo, Mestizo cultures. So we don't have uh, the presence of indigenous culture that much. Uh, we will need to do more research about it, but in general, 
that's it, 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 that's the, the the main reason why it has not been covered. There's a very succinct answer from Deborah Chandler, who's just left. She said, <laughs> "The South is hot, and the East is Ladino." Boom. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I know Deborah. She she just goes straight to the answer. Yes, and, and that's the thing. Yes, but but it, it it's. Uh, I wish we could do more research about the South Coast because if you would find something, but in general, it has changed so much. Nobody's interested anymore. Yes, mm -hmm. too, too many changes and too much uh, Latino and Mestizo influence. Not to say of globalization and all of these modern changes, yes. All right, um, so there were a few people who did try to raise hand and speak. Uh, without realizing that this is a, a webinar and couldn't ask their questions um, verbally. But uh, I ended up with um, one um, text message on my phone, which I, I will <laughs> ask anyway, just asking about the meanings of, the, of a few words. What does the word we feel mean? Okay. What, what language uh, it comes from and what's the original meaning? Uh, yeah, that is a, published in a huge map that uh, it shell, Friends of the Shell Museum cells that you have available. And in that, in that publication of the map, which shows us about the distinctiveness of the Wipilis, we mentioned that wipi is a Nahuatl word, which means my covering. That is what it means, my covering in Nahuatl language. So you see the influence of the Mesoamerican culture is very strong and we didn't even speak about that in, in this presentation, yes. This map will be also on display. So whoever comes to see the exhibit will see uh, not only the photographs of the different repeals, but some uh, explanations of the words. And yes. also yes, that's very helpful. It is, yes. uh, this will be on display and uh, there will be also glossary um, supplementing the, the displays for some of the words that people might not have understood quite today. But um, other than that, Barbara and Anna Maria, you received a lot of thank yous uh, um, uh, in the chat, uh, even in the, even in the Q and A box. <laughs> uh, people really uh, really appreciate it and enjoyed your talk. Thank you so very much. Thank you again for the opportunity, and you'll be delighted with what you will see in this exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all three of you, for this wonderful program. And um, if you would like to get in touch with Anna Maria or Barbara, um, their email is here. Again, thank you both for this program, and it was wonderful to work with you. And it, there's just so much information. Thank you. <laughs> And finally, you can learn more at wheatonarts.org uh, for more information about this program and upcoming programs. And I wish you all a good night. Bye, Anna, and bye, Barbara. It was great working with you. Oh, my God. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.